Good evening, everyone. My name is Ingrid Teneo, and I'm the Deputy Director of the SPAR Career Development Center. And welcome to our Career Spotlight on Entrepreneurship. Um, you know, as we kind of uh, end, come close to the end of the semester, you know, uh, looking forward to, you know, one of our grand finales. Uh, we have, you know, with us today, our distinguished guest uh, uh, speaker, uh, Edricio de la Cruz is a Baruch alum extraordinaire. I tell him this many times, and he's a successful entrepreneur. Um, so thank you, Edricio, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us today to share your, your wisdom and your journey and your expertise and the, all the valuable lessons that you learned uh, along the way as a successful entrepreneur. And just quickly, you know, for those of you uh, uh, who, who don't know me, but I've, I've been at Baruch now for, uh, oh gosh, I'm going to say it, I'm going to say it, since 1998. I've known Edricio for over a decade. Edricio, I'm going to put it out there. <laughs> Edricio graduated with his BBA from Baruch in 2006. So we go way back. <laughs> so <laughs> honor and it's a, it's a pleasure really. Um, you know, I, I, I know for all the years I've known Edricio, he was always very passionate and dedicated and enthusiastic. And he was always in the office, you know, again, looking for opportunities to continue to grow and develop. So I'm not surprised, you know, that he has reached this capacity and is such a tremendous success. Uh, so Edricio, thank you again from the bottom of my heart and on behalf of our students, Baruch, uh, you know, Alpha, Acidom, you know, organizations that you hold near and dear, thank you so much. And thank you also to Alpha and Acidom, uh, you know, for, 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 for their leadership and for disseminating the information about this event to their members. So I'm going to pass on the baton to Alicia um, and she'll take it from here. But thanks again, Edricio. And please, if there's anything else that we can do for you, you let us know. Welcome once again. Yeah, thank you. Yes, welcome everybody to this exciting spotlight. Uh, thank you, Ingrid, for welcoming us all. Um, I'm Alicia Cruz. I'm an, an assistant at STAR. Uh, will you please take a moment to sign in for us? There is a QR code on the screen. Use your phone really quick. Sign in for us to let us know you're here. We will also be sending a recording of this wonderful spotlight out for you to review later. So if we have your information, then we know to send it to you. Um, you can also check the chat. If your QR isn't working, you can log in through that link. All right, so let's get started. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our um, club facilitators who will be helping uh, facilitate this conversation with Edricio. We have uh, Dilcia Pujols, a, the Vice President of Alpha, and Alexa Eusebio, Eusebio President of Acedon. They will be going through and um, um, helping us talk with Edrizio to get all those wonderful, valuable lessons. So without further ado, I am passing it over to Dilcia. Thank you, Alisa. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Edrizio de la Cruz, thank you so much for your time. Um, just for everyone in the room to know, uh, Adriso is our co-CEO and co-founder of Arcus, and of course, a Baruch alum, which is always great. Adriso is a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, investor, and occasional stand-up comic. He's a Dominican immigrant who grew up in Harlem, who dropped out of college to work as an aircraft technician um, to help make ends meet. He ultimately went back to college at Baruch, uh, worked on Wall Street, and the MBA at Wharton School. And then in 2014, he founded uh, Arcus a fintech company. Uh, he worked with an incredible team to build the company from scratch with 100 plus employees, 100 plus clients, and raised 19 million in funding from Y Combinator, Igna, SoftBank, and City Ventures. In 2021, 20, the company was sold to MasterCard. We can see good congratulations on all the success that he's done. So before we give it your most valuable. Can you please tell us a bit more about your company? 
Hey everyone, uh, excited to be here. Can everybody hear me okay? Because uh, uh, I know uh, Alicia was cutting out a little bit. Okay, fantastic. So uh, excited to, to be back virtually on campus. Uh, I I remember I, I know exactly where Alicia is because I spent a lot of time in that library, an unhealthy amount of time in that library. Um, uh, so as Lisa mentioned, uh, um, I'm Alicia de la Cruz, uh, co-founder of, of Arcus, a company that was just recently sold to, to, to MasterCard uh, last year. Uh, to, to reiterate my background, I grew up in Santo Domingo. I immigrated uh, to the South Bronx when I was 12. Grew up in Harlem. Uh, took a very random trajectory to, to get here as a tech CEO. Uh, went to uh, aviation high school in Queens. Joined the US Air Force Reserve. Became enamored with aviation at an early age. Became a mechanic. Helped my parents make ends meet through that process. I uh, ultimately decided to, to, to get out of aviation and, and go into school. No school would take me. So I wound up going to community college at, at the ripe age of 21. Uh, I started a little bit late. Uh, and after a couple of years at community college and doing aviation at the same time, I decided I wanted to you know, work on Wall Street, which at the time was kind of the, the most enriching and the most successful career track you can get out of, out of, out of school. Uh, and I went, ended up getting an opportunity to attend Baruch College uh, a little bit later in life. I was around 23, 24. And then I just became enamored of Wall Street and I just kept knocking on every door. And at the time, uh, Baruch was not a target school uh, for investment banking, which is what I wanted to do. I, I recall, I told the student group many times, I wound up fall of my senior year, I wound up interviewing, I think, a 33 different times, I got 33 different no's. There aren't 33 banks on, on Wall Street. It's only 10 at a time, but I wound up going to each one three times. Um, and I wound up getting an opportunity to, to work at the city uh, as an operations analyst, but I, I turned it down. So I felt like my heart wasn't in it. And if your heart's not in something, you might as well say no, go big or go home. And, and sometimes you gotta burn bridges. And, and I got an opportunity to, to be a, an intern. Uh, and investment banking at, at UBS at the time, which was kind of a dream to me. And at the time, I just decided to leave aviation alone and go directly into investment banking and became enamored with that environment for reasons that I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, that really made me believe in myself and ultimately parlay that into a full time job at JP Morgan as an investment banker. And then, um, then ultimately got opportunity to, to attend what was my, my dream business school at, at, at the Wharton School of Business uh, to get my MBA. Uh, and uh, when I went through that process, I, it was incredible because I went, going into that process, my original idea was, well, I'm going to start a business 10 years after I get my MBA, after I'm very well established, I learned a lot of things. But you know, uh, when I went through Baruch, I was, I was to be honest, I was pretty much a lost kid. I didn't know what I was going to do, what I was going to do. I was older than everybody else. Uh, and I didn't feel like I had much of a chance to, to, to make it. I felt like I was going to get stuck, truth be told. But I think being at Baruch, surrounded by a lot of people of success, I think gave me the, the confidence that, that I needed to get into best banking. And the same was repeated at Wharton uh, when I was finishing business school. So when I was finishing business school, I felt like, you know, this sense of kind of immortality, so to speak, I felt like I could do anything. So, so my 10 year plan got accelerated. Uh, so I felt like I was ready to start a business, but I didn't want to start any business. I started thinking about like my trajectory as an immigrant, as a person of color, I decided, well, if I have this opportunity to, to start a business, uh, why not do something that's impactful and meaningful? Cause otherwise I can just go back to investment banking uh, and just make a lot of money. So I came up with the concept of like Regali at the time, which was uh, productizing remittances. I, I, having me being an immigrant, I had grown up in remittances, received remittances from, from like most Dominicans and most immigrants have. I decided, well, why not just make a different form of remittances instead of sending cash, why don't you just pay your family's bills back home uh, directly from the United States uh, and, and why don't you just pay their groceries? Uh, because that's what the money is used for. 
That way the, the person receiving the money, whether it's your grandmother, your aunt, your mother, your father, doesn't have to go to these dangerous neighborhoods to pick up the money. And you can take care of them uh, remotely from thousands of miles away. Um, and that spoke to me very organically and it felt like something that I needed to do. Uh, but more importantly, it felt like something that I had to do because I had this opportunity because I had looked back and just five years I'd gone from being a blue collar worker, really in a lost path to now graduating from the top business schools in the world. I felt like I was very lucky and very privileged to have the opportunity. So I felt like I, I, I was felt embedded. I felt like I needed to give back. I felt like I had the voltage, I had the, the energy to do that. And I was in a very privileged position. So I, I thought that that was the only way that, that I could succeed. Uh, so I started the company with that concept uh, and got into an incubator called Y Combinator. And, and that was a pivotal point as well, because up until that point, everything we learned in undergrad, everything we learned in business school was very academic and very structured. And I think at Y Combinator, it provided a lot of, they mystify a lot of those myths around studying a business. I, I learned that uh, you don't need a massive 35 page business plan. Uh, I learned that you don't need a very extensive financial model. Those things are secondary. I think what they told me is like, what's important is you need to go talk to customers. The startups are not ideas, I start up are problems. You need to figure out who has the problem and how can you solve that problem? Startups are solutions, problems. And the other thing that it did, did, it gave me an audience and it gave me uh, the opportunity to be an environment of success. Uh, and once you're in an environment of success, you can start emulating and copying other people. We went through the incubator and there were a lot of other companies that were way more successful than us already at the time. Uh, one of those companies ha happened to be a company, it was a food delivery company, which at the time wasn't making a lot of hoopla, but they were growing faster than we were. And we got to learn a lot from them. That company uh, is called DoorDash. They were in the same batch as, as, as we were. Uh, and, and we, once you, you can't be where you can't see, right? So once you see success, it becomes a lot easier to go and emulate that success. So what we saw is a lot of these companies, what they would do is they would go to the customer directly. They would go and recruit customers manually. So we had to do the same thing. And for us, catering to a immigrant community, our customers were in Washington Heights. So we would go to Washington Heights and literally recruit customers manually. Like I literally went to Washington Heights and stand on a corner and hand that out flyers. And I would stand up with my phone and do demos on my phone and I would get people to sign up on my phone. And I did that for a while, summer, fall and winter. Uh, with my fancy MBA degree in my back pocket, right? So it's a very humbling experience, but it's a very necessary experience because it gave you access to the audience that you're catering to. And it allowed you to put yourself in a position where you were a first row seat into the audience that you needed to, whose problems you need to solve. So we came out of Y Combinator uh, and Italy were not very successful raising capital. Then went through something called TechCrunch Disrupt, which is like the World Cup of startups. And at the time, I didn't think too much of it. I was like, well, this may work, this may not. Uh, wind up pitching out of a hundred companies. We wound up being one of the five finalists and we get a lot of hoopla around it, a lot of hype around it. Uh, and wind up getting uh, investments from uh, the Winkle Boss Brothers, from, from Facebook, uh, Fame, uh, Alexis Ohanian, Initialized, and a number of other investors, and wind up raising uh, over $3 million from a number of, of uh, Class A investors. And we're off to the races and go, go with the product and start learning a lot. And very quickly, we learned that the product wasn't working. Uh, we learned a couple of quick lessons. Uh, one, like uh, that audience was not ready for technology. And number two, the audience didn't want productized remittances. They wanted cash remittances because of a lot of family dynamics. 
people didn't want to feel like somebody else is on control of how they spend the money. Uh, it's a very tough decision. We wound up pivoting the business away from the remittance product, had to ultimately lay off half the staff and went through pivot the business into a different product, which wound up pivoting again. Uh, and uh, long story short, came up with the concept of like, okay, we, we bill pay is still broken in these countries, but maybe the product is not paying families bills abroad. Maybe it's just reselling our bill pay technology to local fintechs or local banks. So we wound up building, shifting away from B2C onto B2B, predominantly in Latin America, and wound up building a, a B2B API or platform, if you will, for bill pay in the Dominican Republic and, and in Mexico, which is a big market. And as, as we continually grew that, parallel to that, uh, FinTech in Latin America, it wasn't even called FinTech back then, that's how old we were. I, technology in Latin America starts growing and we started getting a boom and all of a sudden, uh, a lot of banks started using us, a lot of FinTechs started using us, and a lot of um, retailers started using our platform because they want their consumers to have a, uh, a robust consumer bill pay experience inside of their app. So we were the technology behind these apps uh, in Latin America, predominantly in Mexico. Uh, and that's all going well. And then 2020 comes, I'm about to raise capital. I go to San Francisco and then boom, pandemic happens. Uh, and, you know, Mike Tyson has a quote that uh, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. That's exactly what happened. Uh, so all the plans went out the door. I had to leave San Francisco one day to the other. Wind up like moving with my, my wife's uh, parents in the Dominican Republic and start running the company out of there. Um, and basically trying to figure out how to raise capital because again, we're running out of money. Uh, but tough times, you got to figure things out. And we triage our way into cut some salaries, reorganize some things, and wind up raising capital, uh, raising our, our, our last round from SoftBank and City. And at the same time, wind up getting interest from a number of players uh, for potential m &A scenarios and uh, wind up uh, getting in discussions with MasterCard, uh, which was wound up taking 18 months m &A discussions and wind up but in 20, November 2021, we announced uh, we had sold the company to MasterCard in what was its largest uh, acquisition in Latin America in its history. So, um, so long story short, uh, pre pretty excited to have been part of that history uh, and, and part of, like, of a company that was historic and emblematic and part of the fintech growth. But uh, I wanted to... I know we have a few minutes, but I want to share kind of some, some quick lessons I learned along the way that I wish I knew when I was in your shoes, specifically. Uh, the, the first one is that you need to find your why. Uh, and this applies to whether you, you, you apply, whether you want to be an entrepreneur or a banker or content, whatever it is. And a why is not your passion or your purpose. It's deeper than that. A why is the why you exist. What's your purpose? On why? Why are you trying to do this? I think for me, it was is my upbringing and the challenges, the adversity that, that I had seen growing up, you know, in an immigrant household on welfare, having traveled this weird trajectory. I I feel like I needed to achieve so I can be a symbol of success and lift as I climb. That's my why. You need to figure out your why, and it, and it takes a while to figure that out. So whatever it is you do in life, you need to figure out your why. And I think from that, your passion will be very clear and your business idea will become a lot clearer. Uh, the, the second thing I've learned is, is you need to become the chief. And this is specific to people of color, right? Uh, and especially people of color, uh, sometimes we feel like there's a, a bit of an imposter syndrome, right? I felt that throughout my journey at J.P. Morgan, at Wharton, and specifically in Silicon Valley. If you think Wall Street is not diverse, Silicon Valley, you think of fuck about diversity. They don't care. Uh, there's no quotas for investors to diverse invest founders. It does not exist. 
So very quickly, what I've learned is, is that you need to really be much more diplomatic than everyone else. The way you dress, the way you articulate, the way you speak, the way you communicate, the way you execute things needs to be twice as good as everybody else. You need to be on time for everything. You need to be much sharper for everybody. Your presentations have to be, have less typos, have to be clear, just because of the virtue of your personal color. And just understand that investors pattern match. And if you as a person of color, simply do not fit that pattern because most successful founders do not look like us. Therefore you break the pattern. So understand that you need to become the chief. You need to become the Barack Obama version of yourself. I think he's mastered that better than anyone else and I admire him for it. And the last element is that throughout your journey as you go through your, your career, try to figure out if you can get into the right room. The right room is, is, is it can be a, a great academic environment. It could be incredible company like Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan, or it could be a group of friends, all of whom are more successful than you. Getting in the right room will give you access to understanding what success looks like. And it needs to be intimidating, right? If you are in a room where you are being applauded and everybody loves you and you're the best, that's probably the wrong room to be in. If you're in a room where you're intimidated and you don't know much and you are constantly asking questions because you don't feel like you have all the answers, that's the right room to be in. Because you're gonna be osmosis, pick up a lot of lessons from those other people. When you are struggling to get through things, that's when you know you're in the right place because that'll make you better, right? And that's how you level up continuously. Um, so those are three core lessons that I hope that you can take, put in your back pocket, and whatever path you take in life, hopefully you can use this to get you there. Ooh, round of applause. <laughs> Amazing job. Thank you so much, Alfisio. And for those who missed the beginning, my name is Alexa and I'm the president of the Dominican Student Association here on campus. So, ooh, Dominicans, Latinos, everyone of all ethnic backgrounds. <laughs> So yeah, I want to thank you so much, Adricio, for all of those amazing lessons. And I hope everyone has been gaining valuable industry insight that will help all of us attain our holistic success in any career that we want to go into. And having that, Adricio made many different points that I feel like stood out to me, which is why I want to state just two takeaways really quickly of what I heard from Adricio's presentation. So the first is I would say that I learned through your story of getting into investment banking that Confidence is key and knowing your why is crucial. And I feel that many young aspiring entrepreneurs are afraid to take that risk because they feel that others may believe they aren't competent enough to run a business. But if you remain optimistic and you follow your dreams, as well as believe in your vision, it will come to fruition. And then I would say the second takeaway is that in order to begin a new business venture, you have to create your own space. Oftentimes people are afraid to pursue their dreams because they believe that there's something that's already out there and they believe that the market may seem too repetitive and people already have seen the same product or et cetera. But I feel that it's important to make space for yourself because your ideas, your innovations and your innovations to solve global issues or any issue is important and it matters. And not everyone of course will support your business but that's fine because a business is meant not for every single demographic, but the one that you choose to target to. And sometimes you may fail launching a product or a service like Adricio mentioned, but that's part of a business. You learn about your mistakes, about your failures and you grow with them. So yeah, thank you so much. That is all. And I wanna kick it off now with our question and answer segment. So I'll begin with the first question, but please, please, please drop in the chat any questions that you have for Adricio and we'll be sure to get to all of them if we have the time. So I start off with the first question. So are you ready, Adizio? Sounds Perfect. good? Okay, so the first question is, what is the best entrepreneurial advice you were given by either a mentor, a coach, or even someone that you look up to? Yeah, I, I'll go back to the lesson I learned earlier. I think yeah. finding your why, and I've, and I cannot emphasize how important that is because entrepreneurship, unlike other career 
trajectories is a very unstructured career path. Unlike being a banker, a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, where there's a structure, there's, you go to school for those things. And once you get there, there's a specific process. Uh, being an entrepreneur, it's, it's, a, it's a very unstructured process. Uh, that means everything you've learned academically has to be unlearned and we learn in a different fashion. And the, the journey itself, it, it's written with ebbs and flows, trials and tribulations. And the highs are high, but the downs are really down. And a lot of people can't get through it. Uh, I mean, look at the stats, nine out of 10 fail, right? And when you pour your heart and your soul into something, you spend five, seven, eight, ten 10 years into something, you see it fail, it's very hard. And many times you go, you go through the process and you are at the edge of failure. And we were at the edge of failure many times, many times, many times. And I, I write some of those process, some of these stories in, in my blog at, at my website, gstunnelgoods.com to illustrate that failure is as much as part of success as success in and of itself. But what got me through those points where we were just about to fail and turn that into a success was understanding that why and figuring out like, okay, why am I here? What am I trying to do? I'm here to do something that's not about me. It's about those that come after me, those who follow after me. Therefore, I have to push through, right? So it's very important to understand that in intrinsic truth. And only you can tell yourself that, right? And your why doesn't have to be related to a product, right? If you ever watch uh, the social network, the movie, the first scene of that movie tells you Mark Zuckerberg's why. And it had nothing to do with building a social network. It had nothing to do with money. For him specifically, as per the movie, he wanted a sense of belonging. He felt like he was an outsider and he needed a sense of belonging. So he created a vehicle that allowed him to do that. You need to go find that why. And it takes a while to do that. Now, once you figure that out, everything else will come and become easier. And the how and the what are like the vehicles, the, the why is the fuel. And that's what's gonna, once you get to, to those moments where things are getting really hard and you're about to quit, you're about to give up, that's when your why kicks in and kind of lifts you up and gets you to the next level. Thank you so much for that example. I feel like it's sometimes people expect things to happen right away, but things are a process. You won't see the answers right away. That's why you go through try and error. You go through failure to obtain that dream and obtain that vision. So thank you so much. I'll pass it on to Dilcia now to ask a question from the audience. Thank you, Alexa. Um, so I see we have some questions in the chat and we have some hand raised. Um, I know Camila asked her question first in the chat. In the chat, if you can unmute yourself. You want me? Um, to answer? Yes. Okay. No, if you can ask your question. <laughs> okay. I thought she what was going to ask it. All right. Um, so I have a question. How did you find your customers to ask them what their problems are experiencing, especially in today's world where there's technology everywhere? It's not so easy to stand on the corner to try to talk to people. Um, so I was wondering if you were talking to your younger self in undergrad, what would you suggest in that approach? Well, I would, I would do the same thing. And that's what we, what Y Combinator told us. And again, this is why be, being in the right room, getting access to environmental success is so important because they, they give you best practices. So what we thought the process was is to sit back in your computer and let the customers come to you. And what we learned at Y Combinator is you have to go to the customer. So I went to Washington Heights and because my customers were immigrants who did not, were not as used to uh, interacting with technology, I just gave myself an opportunity to interact with them and just stop them in the corner. I would do the same thing today. And, and here's why. Because 87% of communication is nonverbal. You want to give yourself an opportunity to have a deep conversation with your customers. 
customers, they're not going to be necessarily honest with you. So it's up to you to ask questions, get feedback, and assess how much of that feedback is actually true or not, right? So you have to be okay with them rejecting your idea. You have to be, you have to remove your ego from, from the equation. And I think when you do surveys, when you send out questions over email, you're kind of creating a buffer between you and the customer. You want to get as close to the customer physically if possible, or even through a Zoom call, where you give yourself an opportunity to hear the things you don't want to hear. And that's exactly the feedback that we got while we were doing all these customer interviews on the street in Washington Heights. So that part, I think we did correct, and we will do exactly the same thing. Give yourself an opportunity to be in front of the customer so you can hear the things that you may not want to hear. So you wouldn't change anything about how you handled everything? There's not, not one thing you would change? Well, that wasn't the question. The question is how we oh, okay. <laughs> okay, well, um, I was just wondering, would you have changed anything then? Uh, I, yeah, we changed a million different things, right? Uh, uh, right? As far as customers are concerned, we definitely would have not changed that. Definitely would have pivoted faster. Definitely would approach fundraising differently. Definitely would approach recruiting differently. Those things you would you approach differently, but that comes in hindsight after me doing a startup and building a company from scratch over the course of nine years, right? The average startup takes seven to 10 years. Right? But as far as the, the customer process, I think thanks to Y Combinator, we were able to approach that parcel correctly. And, and we were, because we approached it correctly, we were able to pivot soon enough before we're running out of money. I have tons of questions, so I'm going to ask one more before I let Carlos, and then I can ask um, the other ones. Uh, do you have any resources, like you mentioned a lot about all these web, um, not the webinars, but like the, the fields you went to, to put yourself in uncomfortable situations. I forgot what you called that I wrote it down here in one of these questions. I'm sorry. Uh of incubators yes the incubators thank you so much oh yeah like how did you find these resources and like these opportunities like because i am an entrepreneur and i'm always looking for stuff like that to challenge myself because mm -hmm. i'm i was under the impression like you mentioned that you need like a 50 page you know business plan proposal and like everything like that and that's what's been kind of setting me back because i feel overwhelmed by it because i'm by myself so it's yeah, so it's like you need like a million hats but if there's so many areas that need your direct attention it's kind of hard to actually complete something when you're spread so thin on each like each subject you know what i mean no, yeah, I, I understand. I, I, and I said because I felt the same way. And I think that, and that's the, and I think that's when being in the right room really shed light into us understanding what you need to do and what you don't need to do. And the list of things that you don't need to do is much longer than things you need to do. And that's the thing we learned at Y Combinator. We learned that we shouldn't be talking to accountants. We shouldn't be talking to lawyers. We shouldn't be talking to investors. We shouldn't be talking to, to media. We should only be talking to customers. And talking to customers is the right way of figuring out what the problem was and what the solution of them was. Even before that, the reason we even learned about Y Combinator is because we surrounded ourselves by other entrepreneurs who were much more successful than we were. And only through those conversations did we start learning about Oh, he did this, he did that. And when you talk to people that are more successful than you, you can you give yourself an opportunity to reverse engineer how they got there to begin with. And one of the ways I figured out that they got there is just going through this a number of incubators and YC was probably the most popular one. So try to surround yourself by a number of successful mentors and coaches and again in my website i try to make that virtually right so feel free to subscribe because i want to give people like yourself those tools that i didn't have when i was in your shoes i will definitely do that so you said yc incubators is there anywhere else that we can look up to see do you know oh uh, yeah there's a bunch more uh if, I, if 
If you want to, if you mail me, I'll, I'll, give, I'll mail you the list. Oh, heck yeah. I would love that. I would love to have your email so I can email you and ask you. Thank you. And I'll let Carlos ask his question. He's been patiently waiting. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, uh, hi, I'm Carlos. I'm also Dominican, Puerto Rican. Um, my question was more towards the um, the workload. Like, what what did the, what was your thought process in when you're working under pressure? Because when some people are very creative when they work under pressure, some people are not. Um, but when you get to that point, especially dealing with uncertainty um what point what what was your decision process uh, you know it's a huge risk when you're dealing with entrepreneurship i'm dealing with entrepreneurship myself in the medical field and sometimes when you're under pressure it's hard to kind of understand which way to go first and uh, and, and i asked a similar question to actually uh, um i think it was a month ago to juan Maldonado, who's your co-founder and um i just wanted kind of to see what your side of it was so, sorry, the, the question is, is so how, what, was your what, is, what is your decision process when, uh, when under pressure? Like, how was it that you, um, this, when you saw something wasn't working, what did you want, what was, what were the resources, like, what did you want it to do? So, one of the things that I've learned in this trajectory, first of all, it's a very humbling trajectory, uh, entrepreneurship you get knocked down and kicked in the teeth repeatedly. And you learn quick, very quickly you're not hot shit. Uh, and when you do that, you start looking externally for answers as a, not as a way of validation, but as a way of education. So one thing that I've learned is very important is that every time I make a big decision in my life, I, I acknowledge the fact that I probably don't have all the answers. So I'd look for other people that are smarter than me yeah. who may have the answer, who can educate me in the right answer. And that can be my own wife, that can be a mentor, that can be my co-founder, that can be a former investor, right? So again, th this is part of what I said earlier, being in the right room, surround yourself with that. Yeah. The right set of people will make everything else much easier. And just giving yourself an opportunity to whiteboard questions and, so, and answers with this other individual will make the decision making process a lot easier. Gotcha. Thank you. I see Tamaya. Sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. You can ask your question. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Hi, um, my name is Damien. I was actually, um, I saw this and I was, I did a like, bunch of research on you and I found everything very, very intriguing because uh, you've pretty much done everything that I want to do. Um, <laughs> and I'm really, I really appreciate this opportunity to talk to you because, you know, it's honestly like a dream, right? Because you oh. accomplish a lot of things that uh, I want in the future. Oh. And, you know, everything that you were speaking of earlier, um, it's already things that I've already been trying to implement. And uh, you were just confirming so many things that were already in my thought process. Uh, like the, not being, uh, especially uh, what you said about being not the smartest in the room, but not the dumbest, somewhere in between, right? Because you can always learn something more. And yeah. even a few minutes ago, you were you were telling me about how, uh, like, when you don't know something, instead of you trying to resolve it yourself, you go to people who know more. Right? And that's yeah. very unlike a lot of people <laughs> in today's world, where yeah. they go try to solve everything on their own. So I think is you know very unnecessary because there's always something someone else knows that you more exactly. Than exactly exactly. So. You know, I really appreciate this opportunity to do anything and you're a huge inspiration, honestly. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank, I thank wanted you. I want to the question I wanted to ask you was I have uh, I myself have been trying to um, to level up in uh, the people I associate with, right? So I've been going as I've been trying to put myself out there as much as possible and trying to 
you know, find a group of people who are much better than me because I'm only 18, but my friend circle is uh, way older than me, 26, 28, because, you know, I don't associate with people my age because I know what I want. I go for what I want. So I, people my age don't know anything <laughs> I want. Right? Uh, it's really so, impressive. Um, my question for you was, um, where was the point where you found those people that were higher than you? Because clearly from your background and everything I've read about you, you weren't in a position where you always had people who were, you know, much richer than you, much more knowledgeable than you always around you. Was that pivotal point in investment banking? That's a fantastic question, uh, especially when you come from an environment poverty like exactly. i assume like i assume yeah. some of some of us in this room came you know mm. you grew up on welfare you grew up in south bronx harlem whatever it is and you exactly. don't have those I, honestly i just read i read a lot of books i i and i had virtual mentors uh, you know people like like tony robbins uh, yeah and, and i just i started yeah and i had to do that create kind of artificial mentors, so to speak, because I didn't have actual mentors around me. I didn't have actual uh, models of success. Uh, so when I first was encountered with investment banking, I didn't have one specific model of success, but I was able to be surrounded by people that were all just much smarter than me, were much eloquent than me, much more articulate than me. And that's when I got the sense, well, clearly these people are at a different level but I'm here, so I know I can get to that level. And I think, I think the way I look at life is like, it's a series of, of, of rooms, of levels, right? And the thing is, I, the thing I discovered is that you don't know what the next level looks like until you get to the previous level. So when I got to JP Morgan, it was like, okay, this is great. And that's, I thought that all I wanted to do, but I was like, okay, all these guys went to business school and they all went to fancy Ivy League school. So I get to Wharton, went to Wharton, got in you know started the company and now that i've sold the company and i'm in a position of financial comfort to so to speak freedom and, which it was my which was my dream growing the, up exactly the way i did my dream too. and now i see other people that are at a different level and then something happens with your mind is that not only you see it you think you can be it like i got there so i can easily get to the to the next level and it's funny, but that's why I think being in the right room gives you access to that mm -hmm. because it's not one room, it's a series of rooms, but you will not even know what this one looks like until you get to this one. So, um, and it's, it's like a trick in life I've learned that I wish I knew earlier. And when you don't have access to those rooms or those models, as you said, you have to create virtual ones and you can read and there's a lot of mentors out there. And, Hopefully what I'm trying to do here is, you know, I created the website. It's not like I'm making money from it. I don't need it. It's like, I'm trying to be that virtual mentor for you guys. Cause I didn't have those answers when I was in your shoes. I'm trying to provide you guys with that answer and try to, you know, if I can, hopefully uh, provide you with that motivation. And what you were saying about virtual mentors, I 100% agree because that's the same thing with me. I was just looking at the link and uh, I saw you reposted something from Gary V. Right? And he's one of my biggest inspirations as well. Yeah, I mean, everything he says is just, yeah. like, it's crazy. He has yeah. changed my mental state immensely just through a screen and it's impossible. You want exactly. to think about it, like, it's insane, right? Yeah. And, you know, it's the same thing. I've just been looking at everything that you've been doing. And honestly, it's crazy. Honestly, like, what you've accomplished is insane. Thank you. I Thank really, you, like honest, I really appreciate it because I've I do the same things. I've been reading as much as possible. I don't like to read. I'll be honest with you, right? I'm not I'm not much of a reader. I'm a I'm a I, I don't grasp things by reading. I grasp things by you know listening, talking to people, conversations. I'm more of like a you know like a verbal person, right? But you know I've still been sitting myself down, forcing myself to read. Like I mean. Uh, I recently read a book by uh, Robert Kiyosaki, Robert, Robert Kiyosaki's book. He's also a really amazing uh, mentor of the thought, right? 
So like when you speak about like um, virtual mentors and everything, it's insane because um, what I've always thought about was what I'm doing right now is actually something Gary Vee has always said, right? You, you're always going to find rejection, right? But um, I don't know if you've heard him say like cold email text as many people as possible, you know, one of them might say yes. Yeah. Right? You never know. So my goal right now is um, find someone like you who's already done what I want to do and see if I can work for you guys for free for something just to be around you guys just so I can exactly. grasp the idea of what you guys do. That's a smart thing. Basis. Because, you that's know, a smart thing. I think that's the, that's the easiest way to success. Because like if I'm around successful people, it's, it'll come naturally. It'll come naturally. It's like there's a theory the human osmosis, right? Yeah. If you're, yeah. If you're exactly. if five closest people around you, uh, you become the average be of the people. Six, yeah. Right? You, you spend time with so you become. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So I really have to thank you. I really appreciate it. Oh, and no, I welcome, just, man. I was uh, just searching for an email so I could literally do the same thing with you. Uh. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> I was, I was literally just trying to see if it has any possibility I could possibly, you know, um, work for you, anything. I don't need any payment or anything. All I need is just to, you, you get my point, right? Like, just be around someone who's already done what I want to do. The hardest thing, but I think that's the quickest way to climb that ladder of success. Yeah, absolutely. You, you nailed it. You know, I think it's <laughs> just, just being surrounded, having opportunity to to be surrounded by success, you become successful by virtue of that. It took me a while to learn that. So that's kind of what I'm trying to still here to, mm-hmm. to my younger self, so to speak, <laughs> looking at you guys. Yeah, yeah you, you mentioned before yeah. one last question. Sorry, I'm really sorry for taking your time. Uh, one last question before uh, I finish is, are you on, you said earlier, that was the one thing you wished uh, knew, wished you knew earlier was uh, the room, right? And the theory of the rooms that you that you talked about earlier. And yeah, I I learned that through you as well. Like that just confirmed a lot of things. But uh, one other question I wanted to ask was, what other things just like that do you like? If you were back eighteen, back to eighteen, right? Back in my shoes, what information do you know now that you know? excluding what you've said already would have been very vital for your success whereas you know cut your success down like this except for the things that we've talked about is there anything else no you're way ahead of me because when i was 18 i was dropping out of college working <laughs> as a mechanic right at the airport i was not even in college until i was 21 so you're, you're and I, so I didn't have access to to all the smart people you have in this room so you're already far ahead of me in that regard but but i think i think th- those three keys find your why become a chief and get, get in the right room i think those are the kind of lessons that i wanted to kind of distill and provide to you guys and it's exactly what if i got into a tra- problem, time travel machine and went back to when i was 18 yeah that's exactly what i would tell myself uh the tools uh and that's exactly what i'm trying to do basically arm you guys with a set of, of, of tools that i wish i had when i was in your shoes uh and more intrinsically it's possible i think you know uh, living in america i think anything is possible things are a lot much more accessible now uh cost to start a, a business cost to to get access is a lot more accessible than what it was before and you're in the right area as well you know we're working at fantastic mm-hmm. school so thank you so much Adizio. one last thing before I just wanted to thank you for everything on behalf of everybody you are trying to help out uh, with your email blog and everything. I'm sure everybody, you know, wishes that they could thank you for that uh, because, it's, you know, you're doing a service. You're not gaining any, anything out of it. You're just trying to help people. And, you know, that's something that is very lacking in this world today, I think. And, you know, I, I just want to thank you on behalf of me and, you know, everybody else. Who will enroll in your, you know, our newsletter? So, Thank you. I, <laughs> I will shoot you that email later, and uh, my name is Samir again. And uh, thank you so much, Thank you for your question, Samir. Um, so 
We have another question from Emil. Um, Emil, if you can unmute, if not, I can ask real quick. Hi, right, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So I have a question. How many times did you contemplate on quitting? Because I know from bootstrapping your business to like investing and running out of money, it's really hard to like keep on going and pushing yourself. So how many times did you contemplate on uh, quitting? And how did you resolve it? Thank you. Sure. Um, so we started the business 2013, sold it 2021. It's about eight years. So at least 15 times, right? So, you know, many, many times through, through a startup cycle, you know, you raise money, build products, spend money, hire people, run out of money. Uh, and that happened a lot. And it happens a lot with a lot of companies. It's actually quite common. Um, so at least twice a year, I thought about quitting. There's so many things that go wrong and everything that can go wrong will go wrong at a company. Uh, your you know, co-founder may leave, your CTO may leave, you will get sued. Regulators will try to shut you down, subpoena you. Uh, products won't work, customers will quit. You'll run out of money, investors will promise you money, then take it out last minute. Uh, acquisitions will go already. Um, all those things happen to us at least twice in each scenario and you know we're humans and there's only so much negativity you can take and, and again that's why finding your why is so important uh, a lot of people just quit they can't take it and a lot of people i've met that started businesses they, they've quit and they've gone to careers completely outside of startup trajectory because they tell me every show that was so hard i want nothing to do with startups i'm i want a safe job i don't want anything to do with startups it's such a negative experience and i feel like if you have a anything in life you start from a very strong foundation it's like building a house you have a weak foundation house is going to cave in you have a strong foundation earth wind and fire earthquakes can come and the house will still be there. The same holds true for building a business. Your why is your foundation, understanding why you're trying to do what you're doing and tapping into that part of your soul that drives you. It's really important and really key, not only because of the idea that will come out of it, but because of the sustainability of your ability to sustain adversity throughout the odyssey that is a startup. You can go through reps and flows, trials and tribulations. And again, while the highs are high, and we all see the highs on social media, guess what you don't see on social media? You don't see the lows. And the lows are really low, really low. And your ability to bounce back and forth and come back down and come back up and come back down and come back up, it really stands from having a clarity on why. And I think while we did many things wrong, why I did a lot of things wrong as a leader, one thing I did do correctly was the fact that I had an articulate why, and I think that was able to carry me through all those ups and flows. Thank you. Um, one more question. Uh, this might be a bit personal. Um, how many people did you start off with, and how, many, how much of your own money did you put into the project for the company? Uh, uh, people in terms of uh, customers or people in terms of uh, like employees. Yeah, so we started uh, with six people, and I, I had I had saved up around thirty thousand dollars, so I put that towards the business. Uh, I can tell you, six people was way too much. You don't need more than two people to start a business, uh, so that's four more people than you needed. Um, and yeah, sometimes you you need your own capital to start, but even. By today's standards, you probably don't need that. There's a lot of re free, cheap resources uh, that you get access to to build a very cheap MVP that you probably don't need that much money. Thank you so much. Thank you. We also have Camila with her hand raised. Hi. 
Um, I have a question, and this might be a really difficult one to ask, answer. How did you know when you were ready to start your journey of an entrepreneur? Because that's a really hard one to like. How did you know yeah. you had enough money? You had the right team. You had the co-founders you needed. Like, how did you know this was the time to start this journey? That's a great question. Because uh, when I applied to business school, I applied to business school. Literally, I, I actually reread my essay. I said, 10 years after school, I'll start a business. And even in that time, this is the mindset of a person of color, right? We're not ready, right? I don't feel ready enough. I don't have the confidence in myself. And I think many times as people of color, we transmit that lack of confidence to investors. We transmit that kind of confidence to other partners, customers, press. Um, and when I came out of business school, I think what one thing that business school did for me was it accelerated that confidence. Uh, I felt like I had a psychological safety net where if I fail, I can always go back to this degree and to my network and I can use that to my advantage. And I also felt like I had trouble so much in such a short period of time. Like I just had the confidence and that belief and remember, the first step towards making anyone believe that you're ready is you have to believe you're ready, right? So you need to figure out what it is going to take you to make you believe in you, right? Once that happens, everything else becomes organic. Because being a founder is no more than being a, a resource magnet. You are magnetically attracting other people along. You're attracting your co-founder, your, your first employees, you're attracting your first engineer, you're attracting your customers, you're attracting your investors. You are like a solar system and everything revolves around you, right? So to have that degree of magnetism, that confidence, you need to go through a process. And that's why I say you need to have very clear what your why is, because once you figure out what that why is, that confidence comes naturally or more organically. And I'd immediate, but it takes time. But I think especially as people of color, we need to figure out what that why is. And once you have a why, you need to figure out, okay, well, I need to be very bold. And I need to communicate how my boldness, and that boldness will translate as confidence and other people will see it that way and will gravitate towards you. And it becomes kind of a virtual cycle, if you will. More customers lead to more customers, more investors lead to more, more investors. And next thing you know, seven, 10 years later, you have a big company, right? Um, but it's a process, it's challenging. But now that I've understand all the pieces, it's exactly what I wanna do here is tell you guys that it's not mystical. Shit, if I could do it, any of you guys could do it because I'm not even that bright, right? What I'm saying here is like, there's a set of tools that you can do to achieve this. And this is what I wish I knew when I was in your shoes. My, so I have another question to build off of that. How did you know someone would be a great asset to your team? Like, how did you identify your co-founders? Because there's a lot of people who always want to jump on the bang wagon, you know what I'm saying? And theory. And they want to be like, yeah, I want to help you. I want to help you. But they don't yeah. really help you, you know? They just kind of want to put their name on it too. So how did That's you identify who was going to actually be the person you would take with you on your journey? That's a great question. And this is one of the things we didn't do correctly. So at the beginning, we, we hired too many people. We were like six people. And you had many people that were, there were like five business people. You only need one business person. They all came from the same professional background, set ethnic background, and there was, there was a lack of diversity in terms of professional background and ethnic background. And there was just too many cooks in the kitchen, right? So that's one element that we did incorrectly. Uh, there were some people early on that we did, that I did find like were very helpful. And to my comment earlier, being in the right room, you know, we're in the right room when you're struggling to keep up. Uh, some of the people, some of the reasons I knew I was picking the right person is because I felt like, oh, this person's just way smarter. I'm struggling to keep up with that individual in the conversation. They also compliment me in certain ways. If I could do something in business, they could do something in product. 
if I could do something in this region, they could do something in this region. So the second element is the fact that they had complementary skill sets to me, uh, where the other skill sets were more supplementary uh, in the other people that, that were there. So you want to keep your team lean at the beginning, and you want to only bring people that complement you, not supplement. Thank you. That was very helpful. Very much. Thank you so much. Because I, I do struggle with that since, you know, it's when everyone common. has an idea, especially when not everyone has an idea, right? And when they see you have one, everyone wants to jump right on it real quick. Yeah. They can sometimes derail you too, because sometimes their suggestions cannot be helpful and they can Definitely. only play the process. And that's something that I keep running into a lot. Exactly. Right. Oh my gosh, the time has flown by. <laughs> uh, wow, I would, I'm, everyone is like jotting down these gems that you have given us. Um, I'd like to thank you profusely, Edricio, for, for joining us and sharing your journey with us. Um, it's been amazing. Um, I'd like to thank our club facilitators, Dilcia and Alexa, everyone who's joined us today, um, especially our planning team, um, our marketing team, uh, Karima's here, I, I've seen her in here, and uh, Ingrid who helped, our deputy director who helped get this off of the ground. Thank you so much. Um, before I get uh, get you, uh, everyone in the audience, your, the evaluation information. I'd like to let the clubs quickly, quickly, quickly plug their club information. And then Edricio, if you could, after the club leaders plug their clubs, if you could let us know where to find you. So let's start with uh, Dilcia. I know we need a uh, battery here, so let's go ahead. Hi everyone, thank you Adricio again. Um, thank you Ingrid, thank you Char. Also always excited to help and join any events where we can. Um, in the chat, I put my email. Um, I serve as co-VP as I mentioned, as Alisa mentioned report before. And I also put our Instagram, which is where we post a lot of stuff, but we also have LinkedIn, we also have Facebook. So you can find us anywhere, um, ask questions and we'll always be willing to help. Alexa. Yes, I will also be dropping in the chat. Oh, it should be there now. <laughs> uh, that's the Dominican Student Association's Instagram. You can follow us. We have so many upcoming events just to embrace and celebrate Latin excellence. So please, please follow us and join us. And thank you all for joining. Adricio, you did an amazing job. Dominicans, Woo, thank you. And yes, take care, everyone. And Adricio, please let us know where we can find you. Everyone's eager to keep in touch with you. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I, you, you can subscribe to, to my newsletter. I, I drop a lot of these gems uh, every two weeks through a newsletter, I write a lot of blogs. Uh, the purpose of that whole initiative, it's really a, a, a virtual mentor to my younger self. This is what I wish I knew when I was in their respective shoes. And I'm just trying to get back uh to, to to the community so happy to do this delighted to have the opportunity and and keep on fighting <laughs> that's right that's right that's right all right have a wonderful wonderful evening